Kinfolk, happy Sunday. Sunday. Beloved, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, glorious, merciful, and forgiving, you are our guide and our destination. Open the eyes of our heart. Amen. Sometimes uh, a particular Bible text cuts so hard against the grain of the world that you uh, have to wonder if God intended it (laughs) to be that way. Um, We have something called a hermeneutic of suspicion in our tradition. That means we pay close attention to Bible verses that are very, very strange. Uh, In my opinion, I think that when a Scripture teaching is so radical and bizarre and countercultural and not intuitive. I think that God very specifically wanted to include it in the Bible. I kind of laugh in these situations because it's, it's, sometimes texts are really hard to preach on. It's tempting to skip over them and just go for the softballs. Uh, because as a church pastor, as somebody who's supposed to preach on these things, God seems to delight in humiliating us. I mean that in the very technical sense, uh, humility, humbleness. But God is the only person on earth that I would ever really want to humble myself before. So this is a good text today. It's worthy of, of study. A lot of us are probably disgusted right now by some of the things that we're seeing on TV and in the news. Powerful people, typically usually men, usually white men, behaving badly and getting away with it. Hmm. These are questions of justice and law. Now, I'm not going to get down into the gutter and start indicting people, but it's all over the place. A lot of us are very angry at people in positions of power and authority, globally, nationally, even locally. We want to see some kind of justice. No one's above the law. Uh, Some modicum of acknowledgement that this stuff isn't normal. We were just talking about that last night. We talked about billionaires getting away with all sorts of horrible things. And behaving reprehensibly and not getting punished for it. It makes us feel like we're taking crazy pills. Didn't people used to get punished for, 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 for committing high crimes and misdemeanors? Well, depends on who you ask. Now, I have seen one popular quote going around that says that things aren't getting worse, they're getting filmed, which I think is a pretty smart way of looking at things. One of my favorite uh, authors, one of my favorite human beings, Duncan Trussell, uh, he wrote, quote, some poor phoneless fool is probably sitting next to a waterfall somewhere, totally unaware of how angry and scared he's supposed to be. I think about that a lot. Today, Peter goes to Jesus, and Peter is aware of how angry he should be. In the context of this reading, what we see what Peter has to be mad about. This is this text is coming on the heels of some very, very heavy stuff. Jesus has revealed to his disciples that he's going to be put to death by the state. And uh, this comes after Jesus has also exempted his disciples from paying the temple tax. And he tells them also that only people who are like little children are going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then we have this business that we covered last week about things being bound on earth and bound in heaven. Wherever two of us are gathered, Jesus is there. Peter's thinking um, probably about arming himself. We know that he does. He's probably thinking about retribution against the people who would harm his best beloved. It's natural for him to worry about these human impulses. And he is traditionally known to have a pretty fiery temper. And uh, he can hold a grudge. The disciples are constantly bickering about which one of them is Jesus' favorite. (laughs) How long, uh, do you know how long you can hold a grudge? I, uh, 
I think you better know the answer to that question, if you don't. Most of us do. I am capable of holding a grudge for about 48 hours. I have a pretty lousy memory. I say if you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. That's the only thing I can remember. <laughs> I, get, I can hold on to a grudge for a couple days. I, then I just don't want to talk about stuff anymore. I've, I've been told that this is due to my zodiac sign, my Enneagram number, all sorts of stuff. But I think it's really just from growing up with two siblings. Because if you have siblings, about every 24 hours, they're going to do something that's worthy of a grudge. And you just can't live that way. Especially if you grew up in the country. Because at some point, you got to go ride bikes, catch frogs, shoot BB guns. And you can't do that if you're holding on to a grudge. But I know that not everyone is this way. I call it our emotional half-life. I want to weasel my way out of Jesus' teachings all the time, though. I think uh, this word forgiveness is so complicated. P Peter is asking, how many times do I got to forgive somebody? Um, I wanted to look at the Greek and figure out a different translation to make this text more palatable. Uh, the, the English word, forgive, it's, it's an old word. Um, it, the, it's not a complicated word. Um, the first part, for, means completely, without reservation. And give means the same thing it means today, to, 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 to give. So it means to completely give, forgive. We use it in uh, marriage vows. To completely give, uh, it's something like, a, like signing a contract. This is your stuff now, I don't want to have anything else to do with it. The Greek word uh, in the gospel is different. It, it, it means something like to leave alone or abandon or um, kind of like ignore, maybe. How many times do I need to permit a brother to, to sin against me? Uh, there's a transaction taking place. You've done something hurtful to me and I go to you and say, I forgive you. Nothing more is required. In the Greek sense, it's more like an absence of mind. It's a Zen sort of thing. And it makes sense if you read the parable. This king summons a servant to him, owes him a million bucks, and the guy can't pay. And the king's like, well, I don't know. Unfortunately, I gotta sell you and your family to somebody else to pay that debt. And the guy says, don't, please, please don't do that. There's gotta be another way. And the king moved with pity, says, well, okay, just get out of here. We're not going to talk about this anymore. But then that, the king is out a million bucks, but the, he's a king, right? So maybe he's okay with that. But this guy, the same guy that just got forgiven, he goes out into the world and he, he runs into another guy, he owes him five bucks and a sandwich, and he has that dude thrown into jail. And the king finds out about this, and of course things go badly for the first guy. And Jesus is saying this is sort of how it is with God. God's forgiven you more than you can ever repay. The way I read this is typically through the lens of blessing. So I'll give you an example. I, uh, I'm, I'm sitting in my big easy chair with uh, all three of my kids on my lap, scrambling all over me. And they all, three of them, look up at me with their beautiful little faces. And uh, I think to God, I pray, if I had, God, if I had all the money in the world, I could never repay you for this one single moment of blessing. You've filled my life with good things, and you've taken away my fear of death. How could I ever repay you even a fraction of what I owe you for this? And then I hear God say, no worries, I got this. It's on the house. And then I go out into the world knowing all of that. And then I'm, I'm going to shake someone else down for what they owe me when I've been given so much. Well, that's just bad business sense, I suppose. How are you ever going to get rich doing that? Well, friends, I am richer than you will ever know. I think what Jesus wants for his disciples is to 
release them from the bondage of believing that they are owed something by one another. If you look at the rulers and the elites in the days of Jesus, what do they demand from these Judeans and Galileans? Respect and taxes, shine their boots, respect their authority. Jesus wants to release his disciples from playing that silly game. He knows the disciples would love to play that game with each other. But Jesus wants to give them a third way, a way out. And that way is justice. Understanding the difference between what is fair and what is just is a mark of spiritual maturity. Um, Once early in my career, I was part of an accountability and healing circle in Tennessee. And it was for a man who, who was a church pastor in a different denomination. And he had created a, a quote-unquote ministry program that, uh, was attempt, that, that existed to try to fix, fix gay kids. This was a, uh, uh, an awful program. It was a camp. It was called Exodus International. You can look it up. It was in the news 10 years ago. Um, We finally got it shut down. It was horrible. Uh, It was called conversion therapy. It's illegal in some states now. But it's this psychological terrorism. They would take a gay kid and try to force them to change their sexual orientation. And uh, it's a nightmare. And the man who started the program was finally convinced of the error of his ways. He was brought into a group of clergy to seek forgiveness, I think. His work had, his curriculums that he created had led to the deaths of hundreds of children to suicide and homelessness. And he finally came to Jesus and he shut down his program. And at one point he said to me, I feel like a bus driver who was driving a bus full of kids and got into a terrible accident. And I had to be the one to say to him, this was not an accident. You all on your own accord chose to drive that bus off the hillside. (laughs) And you charged their parents money for the opportunity. And he cried and he asked if I would forgive him. And uh, I'm not the one that needed to forgive him. That wasn't my place. It was the parents of the children and the children themselves. I wrote, uh, I did author the ethics complaint uh, to the um, American Psychiatric Association that got his licenses revoked. But it's not our place to apologize on behalf of other people. There's an important word that we don't have in our English language anymore that we're missing and it frustrates me and I have to teach it so often to people. But that word is contrition. Contrition. Contrition is the ability to be contrite, to have a feeling of genuine remorse in your heart. Penitent is another good word. You can't have confession without contrition. We, did, we, we try to make little kids do this all the time. Tell, say you're sorry. I'm sorry. No, say it like you mean it. I'm sorry. No. That's, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> to have contrition, you have to have empathy. And it comes from compassion. When the harm that you've caused actually causes you pain yourself. Contrition is the very first step in restorative justice. It's the first step in getting right with each other, and it's often something that's missing today. How, you've heard some, you've all heard some famous person, some celebrity or politician or whatever, um, caught in being a jackass uh, in public, and then they issue some lame apology. I'm sorry you feel that way. <laughs> and then you think, you're not sorry, you're just sorry you got caught. It's a very sick trap that we've set for ourselves in this current culture. We've got this idea that if the referee didn't see it, it's not against the rules. Uh, And despite what I said to the kids, the real referee, uh, he sees everything. 
ref sees everything. When we're the victim of an attack or abuse or something, Jesus wants us to have the emotional strength to be able to continue living our lives without carrying the unnecessary burden of a grudge. There's a quote that is frequently and falsely attributed to the Buddha, but that actually comes out of the 12-step community. I like the way that uh, Anne Lamott puts it. Uh, she writes, holding on to resentment is like eating rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. It doesn't work that way. So today, Jesus gives us this radical teaching. It, he says for each of us, stop eating rat poison. He knows about all of the injustices of the world. He knows about the crooked politicians and the corrupt and villainous little schemers and the fascists that are out there. And all the rats that come in all shapes and sizes. He knows about the crooked uh, people in power that, that do everything that they can uh, to, to be cruel and make life cruel. He knows about all of this. You don't need to tell it to him. But here's the, here's the thing. He also knows you. He knows all about you. And he wants you to be free and whole. So we do have work to do. You have a choice. You can hold on to your anger and your grudge. There's no law that says that you can't. You can wake up every single day and look at yourself in the mirror and spend that time thinking about the person who's harmed you. You can go to bed angry every single night. You can carry that around for as long as you want. And uh, that and a dollar will get you a cheeseburger. You don't have to, though. We can't go out into the mission field, the tough row that we have to hoe, holding on to our anger and frustration. I want uh, always for myself and for my kids the ability to forgive, not seven times, but seven times 70. To release myself from grudges, to liberate myself from the anger that I may feel at those who've harmed me. Uh, to stop giving space in my brain rent-free to all the powers and principalities that would happily destroy me. And to, add, to, 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 act, to actually do the work of forgiveness, which looks like love and justice. Finding the contrite person who's seeking my forgiveness and when I find contrition in my heart, seeking out the person who I must receive forgiveness from. And above all else, above all else, remembering how much God has given me. Because any mercy that I could offer in this world is but a very pale shadow compared to what God has given me. Free of cost or expectation through Jesus Christ, who is my Savior. Now that is an economy of love that is going to work for everybody. Well, I don't think it's going to work for everybody, but it'll work for Christians, and for the disciples who have something very, very challenging ahead of them, and for all of us. I don't know who hurt you or what you're going through, or I don't know what you're holding on to, but I know that it is a choice and that you can choose to let go of it and I also know that you can do the work of justice through applying all of the wisdom of Jesus Christ in your life. And I think that if we can get to the end of this journey, this little day, with hearts unburdened by anger and grudges, then we will have lived a life for the ages. Start with that which God has given you. Reflect that into the world. Reflect God's light into the world, and let go. Let go. Amen. Amen.